Susan, how are you? I am well, folks. Thank you so much for joining for this Post Talk Live Salon. On the topic of marriage, which I thought would be a great topic um, to visit, given folks are spending a lot of time with their other halves. And no better person to talk to than Belinda Lescombe, who is the author of Marriageology. It's very difficult to say, Belinda. Yeah, I know. That was deliberate. I wanted yeah. to stumble over <laughs> it. Marriage. marriage is work, and so saying the book's name should be work. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. So, yeah, Belinda is an author. She's a journalist, longtime writer, and she is an editor at Time, and she's an Australian based in New York and a frequent guest at the Analog In-Person Salons. Fantastic. Those are such fun. I can't. <laughs> Anybody who hasn't been to those is a loser. Those are fun. <laughs> um, yes. So if you want to be invited, email hi at post talk for uh, those who are listening and have not been invited before. Hop on the mailing list. So my first question to you is, is marriage going to weather the storm of a pandemic is now, is, are more people going to stay married because the opportunities that say in the workplace provide one for um, alternative romantic relationships, those have diminished, or are people going to be, I can't believe I'm married to this person and now it's spending time with them 24 seven. Do you have any thoughts, any data coming in? The data that has come in, the only data that has come in so far has come in from uh, China, where there was a rush of people filing for divorce after the pandemic is over. However, there are significant cultural differences between marriages in China and marriages in um, America, certainly in the West. The um, Definitely the, the um, lawyers that I've spoken to, the family lawyers, um, I think one of them called this the um, kind of Lawyer Enrichment Act of 2020, um, the stay-at-home rule, because people are sort of sneaking away or they're getting calls from the toilet, uh -huh. the toilet or they're on their walk saying, I'm done, that I have to get out. I do think this will be make or break for a lot of people's relationships. Mm -hmm. But it may be make, it may be like at the first four or five weeks, they were like, I cannot bear this. This is so difficult. Mm -hmm. and, but it also may be that in the sixth or after that, they're like, well, you know, maybe I should actually think about what the issues are here and we finally have a chance to address them. I mean, I think that will be the case, especially for people who've been married for a while and don't see each other. There's those marriages that are sort of roommate relationships, you know, sure. where people don't spend that much time with each other and, and the house is nice and they're unobjectionable. But that, you know, that relationship is no longer possible. Mm -hmm. It may be that people who are having affairs and now do not have any excuse to leave the house and see their affair partner have to come face to face with some, you know, hard truths. Yeah. And it may be that people who are parents just, uh, it's the stress of no uh -huh. care, having to homeschool, having a job makes them either just explode or, you know, have a sort of come to Jesus moment where they go, we have to more equitably figure out how to um, assign mm -hmm. roles here and who's doing what. I mean, quite a bit of marriage is sort of simply not getting divorced, right? And 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 <laughs> it's so true. It's just not making a that lot of, to get a lot of tolerating. <laughs> there's, um, so there's even studies. There's even science on this that a lot of the problems that people have when they're married, they don't get solved over time. They just get better at tolerating them. And yeah. Other Take things become more important. Maybe. <laughs> or other things become more important. I mean, you know, the truth is there's really only kind of three ways to do it. You can be single your whole life. You can have a series of rolling relationships, or you can try and like tough it out with one person. Mm -hmm. And all of them have their good sides and all of them suck. So you have to sort of choose your poison. Mm -hmm. Um the studies have shown, the reason I wrote about marriage is the studies have shown it's actually pretty good for you health-wise, work-wise, to try and stick it out with one guy or one girl or whatever. Is it better for men or women um, it, to stick it out? It tends to be that health-wise, so far, health-wise, it's better for men. 
What do you mean so far? Marriage has been going on for a while. <laughs> well, because, but it has had a kind of a revolution okay, in, yeah, in the last yeah. 50 years. So right. health-wise, it is better for men to stay married. They, the men who are sort of, you know, they, they, they did a very long study, something like 80 years, some crazy over generations of men. And they looked at, and they're like Harvard graduates, and they looked at how healthy they were in their 80s. And it was directly correlated to how happily married they were in their 50s. It was an incredible sort of correlation of those things. For women, um, it tends to be that they are better off financially. Women who get divorced, especially if they stay at home for the kids and split up, and especially if they didn't, you know, haven't really had time to de develop their careers, which a lot of women choose not to do or decide not to do for the best possible reasons, mm -hmm. they tend to be um, really hurting towards the end of their lives because the men go on to earn more money or the breadwinner, but the women may, may get a huge slice of the pie, but it's always being diminished. There's right. some very scary stuff done. And, by, and by hard them. to go get a, a, go get a job as well, presumably. If they right. have it's, yeah. it's extremely hard for say a, you know, 40 plus, 50 plus year old woman to return to the workforce if she hasn't got significant skills. There's a lot of things that are fairly and unfairly mitigating against that happening. Mm. Do you have any general stats, I guess, for the US for um, marriage rates and divorce? And It's a hotly contested subject. You'll be okay. 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 Um, so there is, um, they used to, for a little while, um, divorces were counted and you could figure out what the divorce rate was. But they stopped asking that question, I think, in either the Bush or the Clinton years. I can't remember okay. which president it was. Uh, so it depends who you talk to. But the scholar I like, who works at BYU and is a total stats nerd, okay, he puts the rate of divorce of first married couples, so if you've just been married once, at about... 30 high 30 high 30 percent so probably not 50 percent which is the kind of myth which is sort of infected by second marriages don't last as often as well as first and third marriages even once you've yeah. done it once it's less yeah. scary, it's time. scary or whatever yeah right. or maybe you're just not the you know marrying you know the together forever kind so um so um but he if you look at it all it's about in the high 30s, possibly 40%. There's other people who put it higher, but it's certainly higher than you'd want it to be. Right. Considering how much unhappiness divorce can cause. Expense, but it's also expensive to get married. I read uh, the average cost for a marriage is like $24,000. For a wedding is expensive. Well, good time, you yeah. get married. I mean, you can get married tomorrow. Yes, and right, right, right. <laughs> For, for oh. you know peanuts but for a wedding and there was some interesting but not quite replicable replicable studies that the more you spend on the wedding um the longer it lasted it turned out to be that yeah. Was yeah. is it at the opposite or maybe i sort of always hope it might be the opposite <laughs> well, it turned out to be that was to a product of how many people came so if you had a lot of people who were supporting you and you're in a supportive community and everybody was really excited about this and it was like the whole, the two families were getting together and, you know, if it was like your community was going with you, then those marriages um, tended to last better than the ones where people just run off and, you know, go down, you know, the sort of impulse decisions. It was love at first sight, you know, let's get married within a week. Those are, mm, it's a lovely story, but the, the, survival rate on those is not so pretty is so. is marriage still a status symbol definitely definitely crazy especially i think in america less i think in britain and in um australia why why, why in america yeah and why less in the because UK? it's it's a capstone if you people don't tend to get married unless they until they have sort of got their lives in order until they're finding that's sort of new isn't it i mean i you said yeah. with with guys that they're waiting to get married so they feel like things are financially good for that women it's waiting too. a long time actually too i think that's true of women too i think women yeah. want to be in a position where at least they finish college i think there's a thing where they don't want to they've seen that kind of the maybe the generation before them who got married and then mother 
or father or was all they were, they, they feel like their life at their some point of their life is over. Maybe it's the fun bit. This was not the way that our parents felt. They were just like, let's throw our lot in together and do this together and this will be fun. But now people were like, okay, first I'm going to get, you know, my education and then I'm going to get a degree and then I'm going to get a job that will probably lead to a career and then I'm going to get married because marriage now really usually means you intend to have children. And as a result, people are getting married, old, you know, later and later in life. Mm. Um, and so, and... As they try and tick off the various boxes, which could take right. take right. quite a while. What about young folks who are scared of getting married and, you know, they're ticking off the boxes quite slowly and given, you know, say what things are happening economically now, it might even become slower still. I think... I think that's definitely um, a trend and it's mm. in some ways it's a worrying trend for me because why some, because people then they don't get married but they do move in with somebody because they want a partner people as as a species we like to pair up it's yeah, sort of an evolutionary, yeah it's an evolutionary um, yeah. push really um, we need to pair up to find someone to propagate the species mm -hmm. so they tend to live with somebody and once you move in with somebody it's not like i'm getting married we're just moving in he's okay for now she's okay for now mm -hmm. but you what you've done is you've cut off so many opportunities to meet somebody else <laughs> and also you've made it really hard to exit that relationship right because yeah. you're not just losing a boyfriend or a girlfriend you've got to move out of your apartment you've got to find a new one there's expense of that expensive. You've it's yes, it's expensive. And so you tend not to, and people start to treat you as a couple. So you tend to sort of slide into something. And then after, you know, many years think, well, it's not going to be anybody else. So I'm going to marry this person. Well, it hasn't really been, you are my one. You are the person that I have decided this is it. Our shoes are going to be in the same closet. We're going to be using the same bathroom. I'm making you breakfast. Like you're the one. It just tends to be this is a convenient real estate arrangement for now. <laughs> so speaking of finding the one, I mean, am I going to find a soulmate at a barbecue? Um, yeah. Well, I don't think you're going to find a soulmate. I don't I'm Personally, but does the one find a soulmate? You know, the idea of a soulmate. Yes, I'm not a fan of the idea of a soulmate. I don't think you become a soulmate. I don't think you find a soulmate. I think you become a With soulmate. Time. That's what I sort of what I mean. It's like yes. you, know, you see someone, you're attracted to them, you start dating, but they're they're unlikely to be your soulmate yet. They might not know your middle name, much less right. you know. I mean, it is a good, it's a really good idea to choose carefully and choose somebody that you have, you're drawn to, but you're, um, but you're unlike, I think it's much more likely that you will become somebody's soulmate. Than I mean, you basically find. become a marriage therapist, Belinda. I love no, it. No, no, please, no, please, no, is a marriage therapist. I am an observer. I'm like a I'm observer. I'm totally, for anyone who's just joining right now, um, I'm speaking to Belinda Lescom, and uh, she's a journalist and editor at Time and the author of Marriageology. So if you have any questions about marriage, she is not a therapist. She's an observer. Um, write them in the comments section, and then we... We can I saw, I saw we had a great comment actually from um, Amy Shack Egan, who yeah. is a kick ass marriage um, wedding party organizer. Oh, so well, I can she see. She doesn't that. call them wedding parties, she calls them love parties, which is <gasps> much a better name. And it's like, uh, I, I think it's Modern Rebel or something. And if I were to get married, she would again. <laughs> Hoping because it would be bad for book sales is not going to happen. And I would. Uh, well, it and could be your and, next book. <laughs> and uh, her, uh, she points out that yeah, it's if you can get married for twenty thousand dollars in New York City, you're doing very well. Yeah, I mean, well, New York is an expensive place, presumably, to get married. Is the stability of marriage different um, beyond uh, across different socioeconomic classes? Uh, I think. I do think so. I think. And I think this if, is the big undiscovered area of research that someone should do. It's yeah. just so much easier to be married if you're wealthy. 
Because right. I think Angus Deaton and Ann Case, I spoke to them, they're economists. At right. I, right. Spoke to them, um, I think he's a Nobel winning economist. He is a Nobel winning economist. Um, but we spoke about five or six weeks ago and they had brought up um, in, in their book uh, that women are, you know, they're women want to marry a guy who has a stable job. And a lot of, it was particularly with white, lower middle class don't have stable jobs. And yeah. Yes, it's very hard. And and Andy Cherlin out of um, John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University has done a lot of work on this that, you know, with the hollowing out of the manufacturing industry and, um, you know, the sort of tech, the way that the knowledge economy has um, taken over. Um, people in that who kind of have those kind of jobs, the kind of jobs that are also the pandemic is going to be affecting more and yeah. more. Um, they don't feel ever stable enough to be married in some ways, which is a shame because, you know, I don't know why, as we talked about earlier, marriage seem, you know, marriage people want to be financially stable before they're mm -hmm. married. Partly it is women who are pushing this. They don't want to be carrying a guy. They want to know that if they get pregnant and they want to bring up a child that somebody, there's going to be enough means to look after that child. Mm -hmm. That's definitely um, a, a a definitely a true uh, impulse in women, and um, and I, you know, even when even with the sort of I think we're on like year fifty of the women's revolution now, maybe yeah, um, it doesn't seem to be abating that many women want. They just want to know that there's going to be food on the table. Mm. So, um, um, so it, it, I think it is much easier to be married. You can outsource all sorts of horrible, like, chores that neither of you want to do and so you don't have to fight about them. I don't want to clean. You don't want to clean. We'll hire this is not happening now. This is why marriage is suddenly taking <laughs> – there's a little less outsourcing. There's less nannies, yeah. less cleaners, no teeth. Yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> Where do we keep the vacuum? <laughs> Do we even have one? Someone texted me early this morning and just said, I'm just not so good at vacuuming. <laughs> um, is the the idea of the nuclear family, you know, one couple and two and a half children, is is that a myth? David Brooks, you know, wrote about that, I'm sure as you know, at, at length earlier this year. Um, do you think that nuclear family works well? Or is an extended family better for a marriage? You know, whenever people ask me questions like this, I, I do this huge name drop where I say, where I say that I once um, I talk about this interview I did with Henry Kissinger, and I asked him if he thought Arab Spring was the sign of you know a whole you know was he was optimistic about it. And he said, um, you "No, know, and I'm going to do a terrible Kissinger impersonation here." But he said, <laughs> no, I think these people are merely punching. There are no solutions. You are merely punching your ticket to a different set of problems. <laughs> it's terrible, that Kissinger. That is good. That, that, that. <laughs> anyway, so um, and I think that's true. That the nuclear family has incredible strengths, and um, is it, you know two people looking after a bunch of little people within whom they have a biological investment, right? In whom, you know who are carrying their genes. You can see how that is a very compelling arrangement, and this <laughs> is why everybody, you know, all those twenty-year-old kids flew back to their parents' homes at the first sign of trouble. And in fact, my daughter, who's in a much nicer place, was like, can I come home? And I was like, yeah, don't, you know, don't do it. Um, but there's also wonderful value in the extended family. Right. And there's wonderful value in the blended family, you know, where, where people, you know, are sort of a Brady bunch. They all have their challenges and they all have their problems. Um, uh, but, you know, I think it would be great to be able to um, accommodate more in our policies the idea that a family is not just this two adults, two kids who are their biological. Do you um, think that will be able, do you think that will happen? I don't see how it happens without a massive overhaul in the health system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and I think we've seen that especially now where people, if they're not employed and are not married to people, 
who are, are not married to people who are employed don't have any access to health care. I think that's a perilous mm. arrangement mm. and the pandemic has shown that. So yeah. I think that would really um, make a big difference if every American got health care as a matter of being an American. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't want people writing in and saying that you should be interview shouldn't be interviewing pinkos. So I don't want to push that too far. But um, so in your book, you speak of the six pressure points, the six F's right. of, of marriage, familiarity, fighting, finances, family, fooling around. Not my original F word. I was, I was going to say, I totally wrote it down as a different F word initially too, but I didn't. Uh, and and um, here, and then uh, finding help. So let's let's start off with familiarity. I mean, people are really bored of their other halves right now. They're right. extremely familiar. I mean, you know, I didn't marry this person to spend twenty four seven with him. Yeah, and let's give a shout out to all those people who are married to <laughs> lamb chewers right now, and just, just did not realize it was going to be a three times a day, if not more, experience. <laughs> <laughs> Ice crunches, you know, oh, tricky stuff. Um, yeah. uh, for me, familiarity does it really breed contempt? I, you know, I think familiarity does breed contempt unless you uh prevent it. You know, we, I am of the belief that monogamy is not natural, it is not natural to like join with one person. Um, and then for the next, especially since we live so long now, right? Well, and I mean, yeah. 50, 60 years, that is your one person. There's very, very few species apart from humans that do that. Um, it's like, you know, ugly mole rats and birds mm -hmm. and things. Um, but it is, I think, worthwhile. It's like learning the cello or coding or learning how to do a particularly difficult, you know, dance move. It's not natural. But it's worthwhile. And we do a lot of things that are not natural as humans that, you know, that's what keeps us as the apex predators, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we're top of the food chain. That's why we have cities like L.A. and New York and monkeys have trees, you know, because we do things that are not natural. Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I do think that, but so you have to fight the sort of contempt that you can feel for somebody who won't go away, who's always there. And one of the best ways of doing that, I the studies have shown, and it's so simple um, that I'm sort of annoyed that I didn't, you know, think of this before having to look it up, is gratitude. Like, you've got somebody there. Yeah. You've got doing something for you. You've got somebody who is, you know, probably likely to make love to you with a little bit of encouragement. You don't have to buy them dinner. Yeah. You've got somebody if you are cold or you cut your hand or you need something you can't do. And that's a wonderful thing. And you are as probably as difficult to get on with as they are. So um, so I think expressing gratitude for those people is really important. So one of the things that uh, the book changed in what I did was thanking my husband. So, you know, we all have our chores and stuff and one of his is making coffee. So every morning I thank him for making coffee. And I think it's sort of a double whammy where he feels appreciated. It's such a small thing. And noticed, right? And noticed. Rather than taken for granted. Which the is really do not take these people for granted, you know. And, and, um, and, and if you go out of your way to just look for something that your spouse does, that's, that's, halfway even halfway nice and thank them for it and i know you say look you know he makes the coffee i make the bed we're even why do we have to thank each other and you don't that's the point you don't have to but when you do it affects them and it affects you and it helps you i think appreciate the person that, that you're with and i think a lot of people when they talk about irreconcilable differences or or we just we just grew away from each other it's a lot of little decisions you know i go this way you go that way and, and then you end up like miles away it's it's often a, a divorce is not a big predicating event it's right. millions and millions of little ones and so i think if you want to preserve your marriage and i would argue that's worthwhile then you have to sort of just give it some attention give it some thought like mm -hmm. what decision how does this decision affect my partner and my marriage, which we do all the time for kids, but for some reason we don't really do it for spouses. Sure, and and so sliding quickly into fighting. 
fighting like okay i know I you're fighting i don't like to fight you know <laughs> some people love fighting right um i think i called it fighting it's really i guess conflict resolution that's just kind of boring but i there are two things that i noticed about people who are unhappily married one is a lot of them don't ask for what they want they just don't ask they want they something more resentful and they, maybe instead yeah they get resentful exactly mm -hmm. but they they sort of expect their spouse to have read their mind like how could you not have known that i loved purple peonies you know well women are good at that sometimes <laughs> right yeah i mean women are more you know sometimes not yeah. always yeah um and so i think it's important to ask for what you want and sometimes what you want is the polar opposite of what your spouse wants and that's when you have to have these quite hard discussions mm. and there and i think i think they're unavoidable there are couples who say they don't fight well good for them i fight every day almost and i am um, and you just have to be able to have this fight where you attack the issue and not the person don't mm -hmm. say you always do this your father does this you're just like my no good brother-in-law whatever you uh don't say you always or you never never start a, a fight like that always say i'm finding difficult because this is happening attack what about going to bed angry i am a I am a huge fan of going to bed angry. I don't okay. understand that that don't go to never go to bed angry. Why would you why would you have a fight when you're already tired? I mean, this is what toddlers have taught us that fatigue is a bad bad condition for having a fight in. So do not fight tired. Go to bed angry. Sleep. Sleep and then in the morning, you know what? Sometimes you wake up and you go, "Oh, what is that about?" Could have been the two glasses of wine, maybe, right? Yeah, it could have been anything. You'll go to bed angry. Feel free. Yeah. Um, okay. Annoying mouth sounds. Oh. The worst. The so worst. Very difficult. Very like, literally annoying mouth sounds. Clicking. There's What's a that about. There's I think it's uh I think it's Stan Tatkin, or there's a there's a a, a psychologist who says you can tell a marriage is over when the somebody starts to complain about somebody else's mouth sounds but misophonia <laughs> that's right so there's an actual condition that they've done studies on where a sound triggers something in people and they just get really uptight and i think a, a lot of married couples have it. It, it often i think the annoying mouth sounds there are annoying noises all around us all the time and we manage to yeah. cope with them and i think the annoying mouth sounds is, just focus all the hatred that we are harboring for whatever situation or all the annoyance we have at our spouse on that sound and it's there this uh and i think um so uh, you know that's one where you kind of just have to suck it up yeah <laughs> um f for family is it is it better for kids to be in a married family that are fighting or for folks to get divorced, which is better for kids? It's a big question, obviously depends. Terrible, yes, it, the terrible mm -hmm. answer is it depends. If you can have a fight that's sort of about the issue mm -hmm. and it's not like very, very angry and um, personal, personal and aggressive, then that's fine. I mean, then kids can see how people who love each other resolve their differences and that's, the, that's an important thing to be able to see. But um, if you are just, constantly in conflict and really tearing each other up then you know it's probably better to separate because it's just it's just kids don't like to see you fight they never like it mind you kids don't like to see you kiss either so you know they're very hard to please but <laughs> kids don't like to oh, look lisa has misophonia sorry yeah babe. <laughs> we've all had we've all had it we've all had it. <laughs> um uh so yeah if I think a lot of people say never fight in front of the kids. Go outside, go to the car, go drive, go for a walk, figure it out. You know, I the research seems to show that um, if you can do it in a way that does not communicate aggression to each other but communicates a kind of genial or loving or at least gracious working out of um, issues, 
then that's okay. I have fought in front of my kids, so I'm sort of, I would hate to think that I damage them for life, but um, I make a point of apologizing to my husband in front of the kids mm. if I do that so that they can see what that looks like. It's probably um, different culturally too. I mean, you sort of have this idea that if you grew up in Sicily, it might be quite <laughs> noisy, but maybe growing right. up in Edinburgh, less Latin noisy. Oh, is that what you just got, you didn't have fights, your, your parents didn't fight? When they were uh, no, I just grew up in a single parent family, actually. Oh, right. Which is just its own thing, actually. Its own thing, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's definitely its own thing. Um, but it was very, it felt very stable. So, um, yeah. so but I did I not. Stability is key. The children, right. children do not like it that, you know, they do not like the thought that their lives might change in some way. Right. Somebody might be leaving. They don't, and they, you know, they just, and they definitely don't like the conflict. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a hard call. I will say, and this is a hard truth, but it comes from the studies that people whose parents stay together generally tend to do better, you know, as adults. They tend sure. to, yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, they, they have, you know, they themselves are happier, they're healthier, usually wealthier, they are, tend to stay usually married. Usually wealthier. Well, yes, yeah, because it's family wealth that gets passed along. Oh, I see. Of course. You know. right. okay. uh, miraculously, they're not making more money. Okay. No, no, but often, you know, health, education, stability, those things lead to the ability to do well at school and, you know, they don't get in the way of your education and then sometimes they do go on to make more money. So. Mm. It's, okay. Um, Let's move on to fooling around. This is oh, a fun part. Okay. So in, in couples where they're have, where, they do traditionally gender ascribed uh, um, tasks around the house. I do the cooking. He brings in the wood for the fireplace. Are we going to get it on more? It depends. Again, if you um, if that's the kind of marriage that you wanted and you like, where you stay home with the kids and he goes out and makes the money, he's the hunter, you're the nurturer. You know, if if you if that's the you know you you have a very high appreciation for the differences in the genders, um, then those you know those people tend to have very um, successful sex lives. One study says another study points out that actually, when you have much more gender equity and um, you you have both men and women doing the childcare, both men and women doing the household chores, those people have more sex. That and might be because people are more rested. <laughs> more rested, and I think this is key: less resentful. You know, right. it's very hard for um, a spouse who feels, that, again, underappreciated and they've done all the really boring work of the day, the sort of chore, labory, just right. the, you know, there's a, children are wonderful, but often being with them can be a bit tedious, especially when it's a lot of like changing, washing, right. you know, moving the car along the track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, a a, there's probably a bit of a shakeout these days in terms of chores. At well, home. I would I would hope so. I mean, uh, you know, there, I'm the the some of the newspapers have been following this, where women are suddenly realizing, wow, I I really am doing all the work, and right. then having to to sort of uh, apportion it more. So yeah, so the more recent study suggests that the more equitable relationships tend to have a more boudoir activity. Um, more boudoir. I love it. Uh, so with that, should one schedule time in the boudoir? I advise it. I advise having a like, let's do it on Thursday nights. Let's put a flag in Thursday nights because then we're both important. We're both. Yes. Yeah. But also it means that if, you know, you think, wow, we have if if you never have a time for sex, then you, you worry about what it's like not knowing when the pandemic's going to end. You're like, it could just go on forever. You know, there's no, there's nothing to look forward to. There's no hope. Mm -hmm. When you have a Thursday night, you're like, well, I can hold out till Thursday. And then anything else is a bonus. And if you miss a Thursday for some reason, you're like, doesn't matter, it'll happen next Thursday. I mean, if you think about it, and some, some one of the sex researchers who are all Canadian, by the way, hilariously, um, told me, uh, what do we do? in our lives that's important that we don't schedule. 
what do we do? Like, you know, we, if you go to church, you know when that's going to be. If you, if you uh, call your parents, you often do that, you know. Um, Sundays or whatever, yeah. You don't go on vacation and, and not have any plan. Um, mm -hmm. So if you, the important things that, that you really care about, they get planned. Mm -hmm. And I think that takes a lot of pressure off both the 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 more um, virile and um, sexually active partner and the less sexually active partner. Mm -hmm. and that tends to be the way marriages shake out. Somebody wants it more than somebody else. If you both want the same amount, no problem. But if somebody wants it more than somebody else, which happens quite a lot of the time, that knowing that you have a schedule, even though it sounds super duper unsexy, just knowing that you have that it's sort of the stress off, right? And people have different stress at different times in their life. If one half is really stressed out with work, right. um, then right. it, it's hard to get excited to go to bed. And yeah. Stress. And it's especially, I think, really hard for new parents. They're, that's the toughest. Mm. I think that's the toughest time in in a in a relationship because you're both still pretty young so you're both you know but you're exhausted and there's children and there's so many demands and so <laughs> the to put that up is my next door neighbor from uh when i was like four so I still <laughs> <laughs> I to put that there. <laughs> um, what about uh well as far as go back to back to new parents i mean sometimes it's like when you're so exhausted it's hard to feel sexy or um exactly it is really desirable i mean you just look at yourself in the mirror and you're like oh my god yeah I yeah i, mean, I do that. think that's a real i don't i don't think guys have that problem by the way but, i don't think guys look at themselves in the mirror and go i think they look at themselves in the mirror and go let's go that um women i think are so tough on their bodies and that's another really big break on um, you know wanting to have sex and i wish women could just be go like this body is great. It works. Two legs. Yeah, guys aren't noticing that much. Speaking of new moms, Michelle is a new mom. Oh, hey. Uh, I, 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 I wasn't being the right guy. And all good talking points. <laughs> so um, back to the long-term relationships and marriage. Uh, you know, often one person is the CEO and, and CMO and the other is the COO or CFO treating relationships like a a business. I mean, quite often you're stronger than two people when you go into a room together as a pair, right? Right. right. I do think that the team mentality is yeah. one of the key mentalities you have to develop as as a couple. There's there's you and there's your partner, and then there's the two of you. Like that yeah. that that union. It should be so strong as a union. The two of you yeah. is stronger than one plus one equals two. Right. And so but the marriage right. is not about. The marriage is not about make. It's not just about making you happy. It's not even primarily about making you happy, and it's not just about making him or her happy. It's what is good for this team. What works for this team. That's one of the things I think people don't um, appreciate when they get married. That they formed what I like to call the world's smallest trade union because you're sharing everything, right? Yep. You're, you're saying when you make that vow, you say, "Oh, anything bad that happens to me." It's going to happen to both to you as well. Mm -hmm. And any, any setback you have, any terrible thing, I'm going to share the the pain and the, and the and the difficulty of that. And anything good that happens to me, you're going to have half of it. If right. I win the lottery, you get half. Yeah. And that, that's essentially what we you know what we do in communities, what we do in unions. And so you you the the union is sort of has its own strength. And I think if you begin to think like that, like mm. it's not about what I want or what he wants or what she wants. It's about what what's good for us. What, what How do we build up a better trade union or a little tiny trade union? And plan together and build things like brainstorm. Right. Plan, yeah. Yeah, apps, planning together is key, vacations. One of the, we haven't talked about, we can talk about finances. We haven't talked well, about. Yeah, let's talk about finances. Well, what I was going to say just to finish on that, yeah, sure. in terms of like the brainstorming of, of running a relationship a little bit like a, a business is sometimes I think it's, it's, Perhaps good to do that without the children present. Yes, <laughs> right. Because, I think that's true. Yes. You yeah. Know, sometimes you, as a pair, need to be the priority. Um, right. So I, I am again. It's the, I hate using this phrase because it's so easy. But um, you know, date nights are really, I think, super important. There, you have to have some time 
alone um, just with your spouse. It does not have to be fancy. If it can be fancy, all the better, by the way, but it does not have to be fancy. <laughs> Big hint there. Big hint there going out in New York and Chelsea. <laughs> um, it does not have to be fancy, but just um, you need to build memories that are just memories of the two of you. You need right. to have, and when you do go on those date nights, do not discuss your finances. Do not discuss the children. Do not, you know, you might just sit there and have nothing to talk about. Talk about the news. Talk about anything. Talk about go go back to a memory. Wouldn't it be great? Plan, plan your next vacation. Maybe ask yeah. questions is always sort of great. Right, too, right? Right. Ask questions, listen. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I think one of the really difficult things is listening to our spouse because they especially mine talks about architecture all the time. I love architecture, but a woman <laughs> has no limits, right? <laughs> so, um, so but what sometimes when you're having these discussions, I actually find it incredibly liberating because you don't. You don't have to talk. You don't have, all you have to do is just listen to that person. And that is, you're doing exactly what you should be doing just by sitting there and listening. And I think if you can remind yourself of that, it's an enormously liberating and um, and kind of uh, um, calming mm. uh, uh, thing to be able to do. Uh, spouses really need to be listened to. That's that's one, you know, the sine qua non. Mm. Marriage is you you want to feel like yeah you want to feel like someone is hearing you. They heard you yeah yeah they know you and they care about what you say. I mean, marriage is essentially being known and nevertheless being loved, right? So, um, so they know your flaws and despite that, they love you. And the more they know you, they still love you. And that is the most beautiful thing about marriage mm. to be known and to be loved but then to be known and to be not loved or discarded or treated shabbily that's much more painful than being treated shabbily by somebody who doesn't know you yeah i mean there's nothing more lonely than being in a relationship when you feel like you're not being heard moving swiftly on to finding help your last of the six f's when should one uh Go get some help. At what at what stage? Or, I mean, I don't. I don't know. If, I think I would al almost always think about it as an option. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit like a checkup, you know. Kind you of do. like uh, someone helping you at the gym, a trainer occasionally. Exactly, or um, just if you are running a business, you might go and do like, how do I run a business course? Or I mean, mm -hmm. you are taking on this very. Um, difficult and an important uh, situation for your future. You're making a commitment to another person. And I, I think people should get educated about what that actually looks like. It's much more complicated than it was in our parents' day. Mm -hmm. You know, nowadays you can have sex, you can have children, you can have money, you can do anything that you, you, you marriage used to bring you mm -hmm. somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to be married. It's totally optional. So people, I think a lot of people get there and go, what? Well, why did I do this again? And mm -hmm. if you have the, if you go to sort of marriage education classes or read a book or watch a podcast, something. Marriage education classes? Are they teaching this in university now? Oh, no. Well, well not university. And why not? And why not? Um, there is some, everything there's else. some on finance that you can do. But no, usually you'll find like they're done by local faith-based institutions okay. or um, some some uh, public institutions will do them, um, you know, for, uh, you know, the local chamber of commerce or something. Yeah. It's, still, it's still not a, um, it's still not a highly regarded academic pursuit. <laughs> well, but, I mean, I think it's one of Folks who want to find help now, I mean, my first, first thought is, oh, my God, I can't do another Zoom call. <laughs> right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and now I've got to do one with a therapist, too. I know. Oh. Him, and he's so annoying to me. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, that's just sort but of. A good, a, as you probably know, a, you know, a good therapist can really name, can make you feel heard. And yeah. name an issue that like you've fought over this one thing and you think one thing and you've never you always get stuck in this quagmire but a good therapist can really go oh well you know what is happening is this like it's just a third person in the yeah. in the you know looking down and going you know what you guys are doing you're and that happened in my marriage and you know i'm so incredibly grateful to mm. um to our therapist who you, know, you don't have to do it forever we used it for about two years and then occasionally you know 
go to a, a, an education uh, yeah. Here's a question for you. Do you find a difference in different locales regarding marriage, such as New York and rural areas? Mm. Um, I think it's the same, more or less the same difference that you would find in a lot of these cultural things, uh, that um, the rural and, and, and suburban areas tend to be a little more conservative. Mm. And so... Um, they don't have as many people just living together and trying it out. But I do think fundamentally many, and they ask kids this, um, they think that most people want to be married. They want, if, if they want to be married, married, m most young kids, when you ask them, do you want to find somebody and spend your life with them? Most of them say yes. And it doesn't matter who, where they grew up. Sure. Right. Um, yeah. so most people would love love the idea of it anyway. Mm. I think in New York it's easier probably to be single. Um, well, there's so many distractions, right? I mean, yeah, and there's a lot of things to do, and and that you know, and there are so many other things. A lot of things. rushing around. There's a yeah. lot of rushing around, and also, I mean, particularly, I think in in New York, over somewhere like LA or San Francisco, it's most people have very small apartments. So therefore they don't spend much time alone in their apartments yeah, and there's nothing right. like being alone to think about what you want on the relationship front. So you're out having cocktails and you're, you're busy with two Zs. <laughs> you're very busy. Yeah. And there's heaps to do for single people. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, mean, I sometimes think in the rural and suburban areas, it's a lot of dinner parties and, you know, PTAs and stuff where they expect, um, they expect, uh, you know, couples to show up it works better with couples. Whereas in the cities, singles, it's probably much easier. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, I'm running a bunch of, we've got so many different comments. This is great. Um, I'm a 38 above Q. Um, <laughs> I actually think your, no, marriages are very savable. I really do think marriages are very savable. Mine was pretty dire. I got to tell you before I went to the therapist and then, and then it really, you know, you, it takes some commitment, but I do think they say, well, I do think, however, that most people wait too long. And the therapists say this, of course they would, but they say people should come in a lot earlier than they think they should come. Constantly in. do a tune up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah getting your cars, getting your wheels exactly. rotated. <laughs> so if the marriage needs help, I think it can be saved, but I do also think, yeah, people, people do it too. Um, they leave, they wait too long. Oh, this is hilarious. Date night is crucial when raising a kid with an early so, so is the daytime business meeting because otherwise on date night stuff comes up that feels like business because it, that shitty way to spend a date night. That is very true. So, that's true. Yeah. And if you have time to do that, that's fantastic. And a lot of people do that like Sunday, Sunday evening where they say, okay. And of course I, I am strategically challenged so I was I was not very good at this but to, uh, I, I tell you who was really good at it is the polygamists because I interviewed them and they have oh. the business meeting because they have three wives 26 kids oh, they're, and all they, they're all and they, about well, it. they're all business man so um so yeah a google a good google calendar a good uh, or you know there's lots of those family planning apps I think that is really key and then you do talk business it, we didn't ever talk about finances and I think it's a Oh, yeah, yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Let's talk about it. We, we got um, to CFO and CEO, but not the finances. Right. I think money is a huge issue, especially mm. if you have two spouses who are earning um, because people work hard for their money. And of all the things that face you, sex or, or teenagers or whatever, money is the only one where you feel like you personally could be ruined forever. Mm -hmm. If somebody cheats on you that's devastating but you're alive if somebody takes all your money and betrays you financially then you feel very very threatened you could lose your house you could be on the street it it's a it's a it's an existential problem mar um finances so um i think that's one and it's very hard to have cool discussions about it so the business meeting is a really good idea for that and and budgeting i don't think everybody has to have a budget but people i would encourage especially women in this regard know what money you've got and where it's going like don't don't just leave it up to another. Yeah. what what about online dating and finances because you know more traditionally when you sort of knew the family or it was through family connections that you ended up getting married to someone. But with online dating, you, you might have no real sense of the person's background beyond what they've 
they've told you, and that can be financially scary or disastrous. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that you're not combining your finances with somebody before you know them. No, 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 but you know, if like you end up marrying someone quickly or- uh, yeah, yeah, don't don't marry someone quickly. Okay. Don't do <laughs> there, there, okay, there it is. Don't do that. Give it, <laughs> give it a couple of, give it a, give it a year or two. <laughs> don't give it too long, that's the other thing. If you're gonna live together, and you've and you've lived with someone for two years, and you were dated them beforehand. I mean, I think at that point you're like, shit, or get off the can, man, because <laughs> you know, there's it. it decide, make a decision. So. Ooh, our relationships are our best investments. Okay, <laughs> that's great. Um, uh, okay, so quickly, five things that people can do for their partner during. Uh, you know, locked up quarantine pandemic, oh. whatever, whatever you're in right now, <laughs> or that's to make you get out of it, you know, <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. Well, one, yeah. of course, say thank you. Say thank you four yeah. times. There you go. You got more. Say thank you. There's, yeah. a, there's a sort of a rule that Gottman has that one of the big gurus of marriage has, which is that you, every time you do, you say something nasty, you, you have to sort of surround it by five nice things. Oh, okay. <laughs> the five nice things how did you sleep how was your day like show some curiosity um and it's hard to be curious with someone who's with you all the time but yeah. um, do you know do your best to show, try to find just one thing that that they like that's just not enormous for you that you can do for them like do they like to go for a walk? Invite them for a walk. Do they, you know, uh, do they like flowers? Can you send them a cute little text, even if they're just across the room? Just make them feel appreciated. Um, and do your very best to understand that you are just as annoying as they are in a different way. Yeah. You might also have a funny, weird mouth sound. <laughs> you have your thing, I'm sure. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. This is great. And I loved all the questions. Oh, look at this. We have mixed it up. He's baking and I'm mowing the lawn. I love all the comments um, and questions. And we did that this weekend too, uh, Lisa. I was in the garden. My husband was cooking chicken soup. So yay, How modern marriage. <laughs> yeah, everyone's doing all these tasks that they weren't doing before. So much, so much bread has been made, but not very many people. I haven't heard anyone say that they are making butter, which I was thinking about doing today. It's very easy. Butter. Yeah. Oh, you go get out that churn in your neural LA there, Susan. Oh, well, thank you so much, Melinda. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you very soon. Yeah, I can't wait to um, be back at your place and in your those beautiful salons you have have really enriched my life. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll have to do one like this on this topic. <laughs> The war stories post pandemic. No. That would be right. great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.